Assalamu alaikum. Uh, today in our lecture we will talk about a very important and one of the most important topics and issues in pediatrics and in clinical and practical pediatrics which is the dehydration and the fluid therapy. We will talk again about this subject next year. We will repeat it more than one time because of its importance and no one of us should be a good doctor unless he know how to manage a patient with dehydration and to management of uh, dehydration correctly and accurately we should know what is dehydration what are the types of dehydration and how we can approach the patient with dehydration so we will start our lectures today first our objective is to identify the dehydration and uh, uh, identify its causes to describe the pathophysiology of dehydration and, and identify its complication, its bad impacts on the body. To recognize the types of dehydration. To recognize the clinical features and assess the degree of dehydration. And finally, to put a plan for management according to the degree of dehydration. Firstly, we have to define dehydration. So what is dehydration? Is it a disease? Is it a uh, separate or entity itself? No. Dehydration is a sign or a symptom of a disease. So it is a physiologic disturbance that occurs in a wide variety of circumstances affecting water and salt losses. You know the term of hydration. Hydration is mean adding water to something or maintaining the water content of the something. We talk about the human body. So maintaining the normal water uh, content of the body or adding water to it is called hydration while dehydration it is removal of it or deficiency of it so even when we talk about the fluid or the water of the body but the process is tending to involve the salt losses so in dehydration there will not just loss or deficiency of water content of the body there will be electrolyte disturbances as I said, it is a symptom and or sign caused by a disease process leading to decrease the total body water content. Now, what are the causes of dehydration? We can uh, divide the causes of dehydration into three main categories. Either decrease of the intake or increase of the loss or there is neither decrease in the intake neither, nor uh, uh, increase in the loss, but there is a movement of the no, uh, body water, body fluids from its normal compartment to other. So first, decrease the fluid intake for any reason. For thirst, uh, the thirst, starvation, uh, deficiency of water source, of course, it will lead to decrease the fluid intake. Patient himself, he cannot take water. This will lead to decrease the fluid intake. The increase of fluid output or increase the fluid loss, this will divide uh, again into three main causes, either through the GIT loss, which is the most common, and we talk about the diarrhea and vomiting, or it could be due to renal loss, like in diabetes and cibidus, like in diuretic uses or interstitial kidney disease, so the fluid losses through the kidney, or there may be increase in the insensible water loss, that happen through the skin, through the process what's called of perspiration, like in fever, like in excessive sweat, in hot, in hot weather, or in hyperventilation for any cause. And the third category for the cause of dehydration, as I said, is the fluid translocation from one compartment to another, like what happened in burns or in ascites. The net result, it will lead to decrease in the total body water content in general and especially in the intravascular compartment, which leads to what's called hypovolemia. Now, what about the epidemiology? Uh, is it common dehydration? Is it common in the world? Yes. And gastroenteritis is the most common cause of dehydration in infants and children. And it is one of the leading causes of pediatric morbidity and mortality uh, throughout the world. Do you know that about 2 million uh, children under 5 years every year die from dehydration? And of course, this has happened in the areas of poor resources or, devel or developing countries or poor countries. 
And if we take a percentage of this loss from the dehydration, it accounts for 14 to 30 percent of worldwide deaths among infants and toddlers. So that's why it is very important to know everything about dehydration and to manage it correctly. Now, we will go to a fact that is infant and young children are at an increased risk to develop dehydration. They are more than the other, more than the other age group, especially the infants, especially the young infants. They develop dehydration. So why? Actually, we have five causes for this. First is the larger total body water content. You remember from the last lecture that in term babies, it's about 75%. Preterm, it is about 80% of the uh, uh, body weight. It's about fluid. And then it starts to decrease later on. But it is larger total body water content if we compare it with another age group. High basal fluid requirement because of higher metabolic turnover rate. You know the children need a high metabolism for growth and development. This is the highest metabolism other than any age group. So, of course, these processes need water or fluid for the uh, 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 requirement for processing the metabolism. High ratio of surface area to weight promote the significant evaporative losses. You remember when we talk about the causes of dehydration, we uh, talk about the insensible water loss that happened through the skin. So this is called the, evapor uh, the evaporative loss. So in children, and especially in the infants, there is a high ratio between the surface area to the body weight, so this will increase the loss through this way. And immature renal tubular reabsorption process. Kidneys of the pediatric, especially under five years of age, and especially in the young infant, are not fully mature to make a concentration of the fluid and to reabsorb of the fluid correctly when there is decrease in the total body water content. So there will be a loss more than other age group. And finally, and this is very important, is inability of the infants and young children to independently meet their own needs. What does this mean? You know, for us, when we feel uh, thirsty, I go to the refrigerator, I go to the water source and take something I need. But for the infants and young children, they need someone to give the, uh, them the water, especially the young infants. So if the baby goes and or undergo a dehydration, and this should be replaced by taking the fluid, and his mother absent for a certain time, for one reason or another, the baby cannot meet his own need. So it needs someone to give him. This makes them at high risk to develop dehydration more than the other. Now, what is the pathophysiology of uh, dehydration? What the dehydration make in the body? You remember how the body regulates the volume and the tonicity of the fluid in normal situations from the last lecture. So when the dehydration happened, for one reason or another, how the body is respond to? The body responds in three ways. This is the first which is increased in the osmolality of the fluid. And due to what? The, uh, due to this, we will feel of what's called the physiological thirst. So when we are thir feeling thirsty, we will drink and we will restore a bl uh, uh, blood volume in this way. Again, increase the hyperosmolarity will increase the uh, secretion of the antidiuretic hormone. And when it increases, it will decrease the urine output. So the body, again, will restore the blood volume. Now. Again, if you remember the, the, the anti-natriuretic uh, uh, peptide or nitric factor that's uh, released from the uh, atrium according to, uh, uh, in response to dilatation of the atria, here in dehydration, well, there will be decrease in the firing of this peptide, and this will lead to what? This will lead to increase the ADH secretion, and again, this will lead to decrease urine output and restore body volume. What happened also? and dehydration, there will be decreased aortic stretch. That means there will be a vasoconstriction. And the vasoconstriction will cause what? Of course, the renal perfusion will decrease. The renal blood flow to the kidney will decrease. And this will lead to stimulation of the axis that's called the renin and geotensin to aldosterone system. And if the aldosterone is activated, so the next result is Again, reabsorption of the sodium. And the, uh, the sodium, if it's reabsorbed, it will take the water with it. So through these mechanisms, the body will restore the blood volume. This is what happens if the dehydration uh, occurs for a short period. And we can manage it. Or the body can 
regulate or can respond, but if the dehydration is continue, if it is more severe and the body cannot regulate or cannot respond physiologically to it. So what happens here? If the process of dehydration it is severe or it is progressive or continuous. Of course, the dehydration will lead to decrease the in, in the intravascular volume, as we said. This is mean hypovolemia. And this will lead to diminished venous return. And this will lead to decrease the cardiac output, uh, actually. And the mean arterial blood pressure will decrease, so the perfusion to the tissue will decrease. And this will lead to decrease the O2 and the nutrient delivery to the cells. And the net result for all these is to the multiple organ dysfunction. This is if the dehydration is not stopped or it is severe or prolonged to the degree that the body cannot respond to it or we didn't do anything to interfere with. So dehydration also will cause, according to this, according to decreased tissue perfusion and decreased the kidney uh, blood flow, it will lead to uremia and abnormal lung function. The dehydration will cause, as because of decrease, the uh, 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 intravascular volume, it will lead to uh, a compensatory tachycardia and it will lead to lactic acidosis. So, in general, the clinical effects of dehydration, it is related to the degree of dehydration. When it is severe, so the clinical effect will be more obvious. And, of course, it will differ, I mean the clinical feature, according to the uh, electrolyte disturbances that is accompanying the water loss. Now, what are the complications of dehydration? In general, dehydration, if it is severe, if it is uncompensated, if it is prolonged, if, uh, if it is not managed, so the complication will lead to hypovolemic shock because decrease of the intravascular volume to the level that causes shock. Seizure due to electrolyte disturbances. Principally, hyponatremia or hypernatremia, acute kidney injury, as we talked. Cerebral edema, cerebral dehydration with subsequent intracranial hemorrhage and thrombosis. Both cerebral edema and cerebral dehydration can happen due to the dehydration itself and certain type of dehydration. So in hyponatremic dehydration, there will be cerebral edema. In hypernatremic dehydration, there will be cerebral dehydration and the subsequent, as I said, the intracranial hemorrhage and thrombosis. And these two uh, CNS complications can happen not just because of the initial type of the dehydration. It could be because of improper or incorrect management of the dehydration. So the rapid correction of uh, 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 hypo, uh, hypernatremic dehydration will cause cerebral edema, or the rapid correction of the uh, hyponatremic dehydration will cause cerebral dehydration. What other complication? The renal vein thrombosis due to hemoconcentration. Decreased intravascular volume will lead to increased viscosity of the blood and increase the hemoconcentration. This will lead to formation of a thrombosis involving the renal veins. And if anything not happen, if there is no interference, the eventual uh, 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 action it will be the coma and death. Now, what are the types of dehydration? Actually, we have to divide the dehydration according to its degree and according to its types. Before taking the degrees of dehydration and how we assess the degree of dehydration, we will talk about the types of dehydration. The types of dehydration are divided into three main types. And this divided, this division, sorry, according to the sodium loss or the sodium content. So. The first is the isonatremic or the isotonic dehydration. You know, the normal value of the serum sodium, it is 135 to 145, but in dehydration, we can spread or we can increase the normal uh, range to be 130 to 150. So anything is below than 130, this is mean hyponatremic dehydration, and anything more than 150, this mean hypo. Uh, sorry, the hypernatremic dehydration. So the hypernatremic, or sometimes called hypertonic, as I said, more than 150, and the hyponatremic is less than 130. Now we will talk about the isonatremic dehydration. When it happened? This is happened when there is equal loss of sodium 
and water from the body. And this can have it in acute diarrhea. Because in acute diarrhea, and we will talk about in the diarrhea and gastroenteritis and the lectures on the GIT, but now just to, uh, to uh, discuss the dehydration. But because there is a close relation between dehydration and the GI loss, so we will uh, hear a lot of uh, gastroenteritis about diarrhea and vomiting in this lecture. So, as I said, there is equal balance or, or, or equal loss of the sodium and water. This is what happens in acute diarrhea. It is the most common cause of the uh, 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 dehydration, or it is the most common type, about 80%. And it has our, uh, the best prognosis. In this type of dehydration, because there is a balanced loss of water and sodium, so there will be no shifting of fluid from the extracellular to the intracellular. And this is the good thing, and that's why it has a good prognosis or the best prognosis. Now, the hypernatremic dehydration. Here is, in hypernatremic dehydration, the loss of the water is more than the sodium, so the serum sodium will be higher than the normal. It accounts for about 10 to 15 percent of the cases of dehydration. It's most commonly seen in diarrhea again. But here, there is inadequate water replacement. Suppose you have a patient, you have a child with diarrhea, but they didn't receive water replacement adequately. So there will be increased loss of water more than the sodium or in cases of diabetes insipidus. And in high fever, there is loss of water more than the sodium. It is the most dangerous form of dehydration. Why? Because it has a mortality rate may reach up to 20% because of the CNS complication, which is, as it may be so severe in about 5 to 10% of the uh, uh, cases of uh, dehydration. Here, because there is a hypernatremic dehydration, so the fluid will shift from the intracellular into the extracellular fluid to maintain the osmolarity between two compartments. Thus, the children may be less hemodynamically compromised. What does this mean? If there is a movement of a fluid from the intracellular to the extracellular, so the loss of fluid from the intravascular compartment, it will be internally replaced. So the patients that, w that have hypernatremic dehydration will present it to us later on. Actually, we see the cases of severe hypernatremic dehydration more than the moderate hypernatremic dehydration because of the preservation of the intravascular volume and the clinical feature will uh, be late in appearance and the family will seek the medical advice uh, later on. So, how we can reach to the diagnosis of patients of hypernatremic dehydration from clinical examination? Those patients will be somnolent. What we mean by somnolent? This means sleepy, lethargic, because they have severe de uh, dehydration. But they are hyper irritable when just stimulated. The patient is lethargic, sleepy. Just touch him. He will start to cry and, and high pitch cry and uh, uh, cannot be calmed. And their skin feel doughy. What do we mean by doughy? Doughy in Arabic, or uh, it mean, uh, uh, or a dough, it mean al ajin Or sometimes they call it velvet or velvety, like al mahmal in Arabic. So the skin of those patients with hypernatremic dehydration become doughy because the relative uh, uh, preservation of the intravascular volume because of the shifting of fluid from the intracellular to the extra cellular compartment. Now, we go to the hyponatremic dehydration. In hyponatremic dehydration, of course, there will be loss of sodium more than the water. It involves combination of sodium and water loss. Then there will be retention of the water to compensate for the volume depletion. This is the usual response of the body. So a patient with dehydration, if not received, in, uh, uh, at the beginning, or if we give him just a, a tab fluid, simple fluid, without electrolytes, there will be fluid relatively more than the sodium, or the sodium is lost relatively more than the fluid, given the uh, type of hyponatremic dehydration. It's account for five, uh, five to ten percent of the cases, and again, 
in this type of dehydration, there will be a shifting or movement between the compartments of the body fluid. But the movement here is from the intravascular or the extracellular to the intracellular space, leading to what? This will exacerbate the intravascular fluid depletion. By the disease, by the problem itself, there will be a fluid loss. And because of the movement of the fluid from the intravascular to the intra intra intracellular, there will be more depletion. And the fluid goes inside the cell, will lead to what? If the, if the fluid goes inside the cell, will lead to cerebral edema and its complication. It's most typically occur in older infants and children with diarrhea that was given low sodium content fluid, just as I said to you. So that's why we always recommend and advise the mother not give your child with diarrhea or with dehydration just water. Never, because this will lead to electrolyte disturbance. What is the electrolyte disturbance we mean by this uh, caution or by this warning? Is the hyponatremia. So, those patients, actually, all types of dehydration, isonatremic, hypernatremic, and hyponatremic, can happen in one scenario, in one patient. He can have, or sorry, he can have all these three types of dehydration. How? Primarily, at the beginning of acute diarrhea, he will have balance, he will have balance, loss of sodium and water. So, this will lead to what? This will lead to isonatremic dehydration. Then, for uh, for certain cause, he didn't receive a fluid. He didn't receive a fluid. The mother didn't uh, uh, give him a fluid. So he will have a loss of a fluid more than the sodium. This will lead to appearance of hypernatremic dehydration. Then the mother uh, tried to replace him with simple fluid, like just water. So he will develop hyponatremic dehydration. Again, all three types of dehydration can happen in one scenario and just acute diarrhea. Now we will go to the uh, clinical manifestations of dehydration, which is very important. This is the first step uh, uh, to assess the degree of dehydration, and the type of dehydration is to look at the clinical manifestations of those patients. So this table will show the degree of dehydration that is divided into three levels, mild, moderate, and severe. And here are the parameters that should be checked to reach to the assessment of degree of dehydration. So what we mean by uh, uh, saying the degree of dehydration is uh, a mild and there is a loss of about a 3 to 5 percent. This is mean there is a loss of body weight in about a 3 to uh, 5 percent. Suppose you know the weight of your patient before developing the dehydration. So he will lose 3 to 5 percent of his previous weight if he has mild dehydration, and 6 to 10 if he has moderate, and more than 10, up to 15 percent if he has severe dehydration. Then we have to check the skin for the targers. What is the targers? The targers are the skin pinch of the abdomen. This is uh, making uh, in, in, in children, and this reflects the tissue perfusion. So we will uh, see the decrease release of the uh, uh, recoil of the skin turgor after pinch. This, is hap this happened in degrees of dehydration. The hemodynamic signs, this is very important regarding the pulse, you know, because in hypovolemia will lead to increase in the rate then if there is severe dehydration, not just the rate will increase, the volume also will decrease. So we will have weak and rapid pulse. The capillary refill, which is again a sign of uh, tissue perfusion, the blood pressure will decrease, and the fluid loss. Always, and though for your uh, colleagues that uh, attend for the clinical session, we ask about the uh, degree of dehydration in relation to the fluid uh, uh, loss. That means to the urine output. If there is dehydration, of course there will be decrease in the fluid uh, or urine output, starting from mild oliguria and extending to be anuria or absence of uh, 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 urine. And of course, the specific gravity of the urine will increase because it will be concentrated urine. And the sodium loss, the sodium loss will change if there is decrease in the uh, 
uh, uh, urine output. Here is again the, uh, uh, the uh, levels or the degrees of dehydration according to these parameters. All of you should keep in mind all these parameters and when we say what is mild dehydration, so we have to know that they have a normal heart rate, normal capillary flow, normal peripheral pulses, and again, if we say moderate, so the heart rate should, should be like this, if we, uh, if we say uh, severe dehydration, so the peripheral pulses, difficult to palpate, that means weak. And again, this, these two tables should be keep in mind. Now, this picture will show what we will do in examination of patients with dehydration. Starting from palpation of the fontanelle in dehydration, it will be sunken. Going to the level of consciousness. We will, so we will see the patient lethargic or decreased level of consciousness. The eyes will be sunken. And when the patient is crying without tears, the mouth and the mucous membrane will be dry. And if we look at the uh, respiration, the pattern of breathing, we will find it will be tachypnea, not just increase in the rate of per, uh, breathing. There will be increase in the depth. So it will be rapid deep breathing. This is called the acidotic breathing in severe dehydration. If we check the skin pinch for the skin turgors in this way, so it will be reduced or prolonged tissue turgor or skin turgor because of the decreased tissue perfusion. Of course, they will, they will have sudden weight loss. And according to the percentage of weight loss, we can say this is mild, moderate, and severe dehydration. Of course, they have oliguria. And how we ask about the oliguria, we ask the mother, how many times you change the diaper per day? Before the illness, uh, you were changing the diapers uh, four times, uh, five times. Now it is the same or not. This is the first. Second, how is the status of diaper in each time you change it? Is it wet? Is it sucked? Or is it dry? So if it is dry or it is just wet with decrease in, in, in the times, this is mean oliguria. If we check his pulse, of course, it will be uh, uh, tachycardia with weak pulses and hypotension and there will be reduced capillary refills. Now, this picture show a child, an infant with severe dehydration. And you can see here, there is a sunken eyes and the patient looks lethargic. The other patient, the same, lethargic and sunken eyes. These are two signs of severe dehydration. This picture show how we perform the skin turgor. As you see here, this patient has severe dehydration because after release of a skin pinch, the skin not recoil uh, uh, to its normal uh, posture or its normal position because this needs a momentary recoil. So this is called reduced skin turgor or decreased or sometimes called prolonged. This is, again, another picture shows the reduced skin turgor. This is after releasing of the skin pinch, but the skin is still, because decreased elasticity, because decreased perfusion, is still wrinkled and not recoiled momentarily. Again, this picture shows the reduced skin turgor, and you can notice here the baby is irritable and crying. Again, this is a sign of severe dehydration. And this is what is called the dough skin. The dough skin is like, as I say, al -ajin. So, which type? al ajin al-sayih. al ajin al-sayih, al muhtamar al-sayih. So, this, this condition is seen in hypernatremic dehydration, the dough skin. Why dough skin? Because the preservation of the intravascular volume, because of the movement, the shifting of a fluid from the intracellular to the extracellular and specifically to the intravascular, so there will be preservation of the tissue elasticity to the degree that it may be like a doughy skin. Now, this table will show the estimated water and electrolyte deficit in, the, in severe dehydration. You, we, uh, you know, we talk about the isotonic, hypotonic, hypertonic, or sometimes we call it the isonatremic or hyponatremic, and etc. Here in isotonic, we say there is balance of a fluid 
and sodium and of course other uh, electrolytes but what which is the most important is the sodium so an isotonic you can see here the loss of a fluid and the loss of the uh, sodium but in hypotonic you can see here the loss of a fluid is less than and the sodium is more while in hypertonic, the loss of a fluid is more than the normal or more than the balance and the loss of the sodium is low. So the result is hypernatremic dehydration and increase the serum sodium. Now, we go to the most important and the clinical uh, point, which is the management of dehydration. How we manage patients with dehydration? Of course, the cornerstone, the backbone, is taking history. So what we will ask in history? Of course, we will ask about the fluid loss. Is there fluid loss more than the normal? That's mean by GIT, diarrhea and vomiting. Or there, there, there decrease of oral intake. You go back to the causes of the uh, dehydration. Then, general condition of the baby. Is he tired, listlessness, or there's absence of tear when the patient is crying? This is at home. The mother will say, yes, he is crying without tears. This is a sign of dehydration. Thirsty. This is a very important sign to ask in history. You will ask the mother, when you give him water, does he drink eagerly? Or he cannot drink or drink normally? And what are the amount of fluid you give it? Low salt water, like uh, uh, liquid like water, juice or soda and tea. This will cause hyponatremic dehydration, as we said. So this is important. And you have to ask about change in your output. And I explained to you how we ask about uh, the assessment of the changing in the urine output. Now we will go to the physical examination. This is our job at the clinics, at the hospital, at the ward. Start with general condition. It could be well. It could be unconscious, a severe dehydration. The case is skin elasticity, which is the skin turgor dry mucous membrane, we can notice it, and sunken eyes and depressed fontanelle in a young infant. If the fontanelle is still open, we can palpate it, and we will see it is depressed and severe dehydration, and we can see the sunken eyes. The abnormal respiration, as I said, rapid and deep breathing, which is acidotic breathing. Tachycardia and abnormal pulses should be checked in examination, and the capillary refill by pressure on the, on the nail, or on the sternum or on the airlobe to check the capillary refill and we should know the normal time of the capillary refill to return to normal which is another indicator of tissue perfusion and we should weigh the child suppose you know the previous weight of the child and now you will weigh him again and you will see the difference of course the child should be made completely in both weights to see the difference in percentage because the numbers in, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, will help you in determining the degree of dehydration. Now, investigation also has a role in assessment of degree and type of dehydration. So, serum sodium, of course, very important. If you cannot reach to decide this is a hypernatremic or hyponatremic or isonatremic, serum sodium will help you to see the type of dehydration. Of course, blood gas analysis to assess the pH and HCO3 because you, you will uh, uh, expect the patient to have metabolic acidosis and there will be loss of the bicarbonate through the GIT, through the, with the stool. Serum sodium is very important because you uh, suppose your patient will have metabolic acidosis and there will be hyperkalemia in these conditions. You sub, uh, expect the blood urea to increase because there is an acute kidney injury. This is called the pre-renal because decreased renal perfusion, decreased renal blood flow. So the blood urea will in increase, but the serum creatinine, which is an indicator of the interstitial kidney disease or chronic disease, it will be normal in acute kidney injuries. The general urine examination is very important, and of course, you will check the urine-specific gravity. It will increase more than the normal because the urine is concentrated. Blood glucose, again, will help you. And of course, I think you know, uh, we will find that our patient is hypoglycemic because decrease intake. And CBC important, and we can see hemoconcentration due to hypovolemia, although the patient may have 
anemia, but there will be relative hemoglobin concentration and increase in the PC level because of the hypovolemia. Now we will go to treatment. Performing the history, the proper physical examination, sending for investigation, and that now we put a plan for the treatment of the dehydration. What are the phases of a treatment? It is to rapid expansion of the extracellular fluid volume and restoring tissue perfusion. Of course, we are talking about the severe dehydration because the most dangerous. And the, it is a matter of time to correct the dehydration and electrolyte disturbances, and you will make the difference. You will uh, move the patient from a threatened life to uh, be completely healthy and restore his normal health status before this acute dangerous illness. So we will talk firstly about the uh, uh, severe dehydration. First, the first phase of the uh, treatment is to rapid expansion of the extracellular volume and to restore the tissue perfusion because your patient may have hypovolemia. Then you have to replenish the fluid and electrolyte deficit with correcting uh, then attendant acid-base balance. You have to replace the fluid loss and you have to correct the, the electrolyte disturbances and you have to correct the acid-base imbalance again. Then you have to meet the nutritional needs of the patient. The patient normally and uh, uh, in his life, he takes his requirements from fluid and electrolytes. So you have to meet the, uh, their needs by giving the maintenance of fluid. And you have to replace of the ongoing loss. Your patient, after admission, he may have continuous loss through the GIT by vomiting or diarrhea. So you have to replace these ongoing losses. Now, of course, we are talking about severe dehydration. The initial resuscitation phase is to restore the hypovolemia. Then you have to put a plan of a fluid therapy for the next 24 hours after correction of hypovolemia. Then, as I said, you have to replace the fluid loss according to the degree of dehydration and to meet the usual requirement by giving the maintenance of fluid and to monitor and adjust therapy. And we will know what we mean by monitoring and adjusting therapy. Now, the initial resuscitation phase, and this is very important. Here, you have to require the rapid restoration of the circulating intravascular volume and treatment of shock. How? This is by giving a ball of dose of 20 ml per kg of isotonic fluid. You remember from the last lecture, the isotonic fluid that can be given in the initial station, it's either normal saline or ring lactate. This is given over 20 minutes. Why? Because the isotonic fluid will not cause a change or shifting of a fluid from the compartments of the body. And it will keep the fluid given inside the intravascular volume. And this is your aim to increase the intra or uh, uh, the vascular volume and to correct the uh, hypovolemic shock. Now, this caution is very important. Ringer lactate, although it is isotonic fluid, but if you remember from the last lecture, because it contains less amount of sodium, so it should not be given in hypernatremic dehydration. Why? Because it will lead to rapid, rapid correction of the hypernatremia and would may cause cerebral edema. So it's better to use in hypernatremic dehydration, normal saline. Then, what we do if we have no IV uh, uh, site? Uh, because the hypovolemia, the vein are closed, collapsed, and you cannot get uh, to the intravenous line. You may give the fluid through intraosseous uh, excess, through bone marrow of the uh, uh, tibia. Now, the child may require multiple fluid boluses. You give these 20 ml per kg for 20 minutes, but the patient is still hypovolemic. You can repeat the bolus for one time, two times, and uh, uh, thrice, as fast as possible, to restore the intravascular volume. The initial resuscitation is complete when the child has an adequate intravascular volume. Now, after correction of hypovolemia, you say the initial resuscitation is uh, uh, completed, and your patient now may be so severely dehydrated, but it is not hypovolemic, which is the most important. Now, in this picture, we can show how we can approach to intraosseous excess. Here is the intraosseous or medullary venous sinusoids. We can insert this 
needle inside the intraosseous and the tibia. This will correct the hypovolemia if there is no IV line. Then after correction of hypovolemia, the IV line will be uh, accessible and we can change to the uh, usual or standard way. Now, after the initial phase, we say plan the fluid therapy for the next 24 hours. And here you have to de de uh, determine the type of a fluid and the rate of a fluid. How you will choose the type of a fluid and how you will determine the rate of a fluid or the, uh, in, in 24 hours. This is determined according to the degree of dehydration and type of dehydration. So as I said, after correction of hypovolemia, suppose your patient is still severely dehydrated. This is different from and moderate dehydration or according to the type, uh, sorry, not or, and the type of dehydration because in hypernatremic dehydration, the plan will be extended more than 24 hours to prevent the rapid correction of hypernatremia, while in isonatremic and in hyponatremic, it can be managed in 24 hours. Now, replacement and maintenance phase. How we check the replacement and maintenance phase? Replacement of fluid deficit. This is mean the degree of dehydration. We detect it by physical examination. And maintenance of fluid. Normally, the body needs fluid in normal circumstances. Here you can, you should replace it. And replacement of ungoing loss, that loss uh, through the GIT, uh, diarrhea and vomiting. Now, replacement of fluid deficit is based on the percentage of dehydration, as I said. And this equation is enough to know the replacement. The fluid deficit is calculated by multiplying the body weight and the percentage of dehydration in a constant which is 10. So suppose you have a patient has his weight uh, uh, 5 kg and has 6% of dehydration. So the fluid deficit here is a 300 mole by multiplying the body weight and the percentage of dehydration. And we have the constant, which is 10. This is the fluid deficit. Now, what is the maintenance? How we can detect the maintenance of fluid? The maintenance of fluid calculation is based on weight and caloric expenditure. And we have a, a formula called Holiday-Seeger formula. Now, this formula, if the weight of the child is a 3 to 10 kg, this is mean the first 10 kg, so we have to give him 100 ml per water of water or of fluid per kg. But for those weights between 11 and 20, we have to give, give him 1,000 for the first 10 and 50 ml per kg for each kg more than 10. And for those more than 20 kg, we have to give him 105,000. This is come from the 1,000 for the first 10 and 500 for the second 10. Then we will add 20 ml per kg for each kilogram more than 20 kg. In this way, we can detect the uh, uh, maintenance. So if you have a child, his weight is uh, about 22 kg, you have to give him 1,500. 40 mole, and you can check it with yourself again. Now, the maintenance and deficits should be given together. Now, you know the deficit and you know the maintenance. This is, should be given together in 24 hours. This is in cases of hyponatremic and isonatremic dehydration. But you have to subtract the isotonic fluid you already administer to the baby in the initial resuscitation. So if you give him more than three bolus, uh, sorry, more than one bolus, you have to collect them and remove it from the total amount. The net amount of fluid is given over 24 hours in isonatomic or hypernatomic dehydration in this way. The half of the amount given in eight hours. And the half of the amount, the second half I mean, given in the next 16 hours. So this is equal to 24 hours. Now, we detect the uh, type of fluid, uh, we detect, sorry, uh, the amount of fluid, and the rate. Now we have to say what is the type of fluid used. Of course, in hypernatremic dehydration, I said before, because we should avoid the rapid decrease in the serum sodium, we will extend the plan over 48 hours. The types of fluid used. If the baby is weight less than 10 kg, so it will be dextrose 5% in quarter normal saline plus 20 ml, uh, uh, sorry, 20 ml equivalent per liter of KCL. You know, the patient 
you have to replace the fluid with KCL because if you give fluid without KCL, the patient will develop hypokalemia. So these are for the less than 10 kg. For children who ate more than 10 kg, we can give 5% dextrose and half normal saline, of course, with the same amount or the same concentration of KCL. Now, you can see the dextrose 5% and, and half and quarter normal saline, both regarded as hypertonic fluid that can be given in maintenance. Then, the maintenance e electrolyte requirement, the body needs uh, sodium and 3 milliequivalent per liter and the potassium 2 milliequivalent per liter. This is uh, meeting by giving this type of fluid with the uh, sodium chloride. Uh, uh, sorry, the potassium chloride. Now, the caution is the potassium is not usually included in the IV fluid until the patient has voiding or you are sure of normal urine function by the blood urea and serum creatinine. And the method contain 5% dextrose. Why 5% dextrose? Because the patient didn't take anything because of the vomiting or because decrease the intake. So he will have hypoglycemia. Uh, uh, and you have to replace uh, the uh, caloric requirement. And just given 5% glucose in the fluid, this will meet just about 20% of the maintenance caloric needed in, circum in, in normal circumstances. Now we will go to the replacement of ongoing losses. We say the continuous diarrhea or continuous vomiting. For the diarrheal loss, we have to give the dextrose 5% and half normal saline and we should provide with uh, potassium chloride and sodium bicarb because we uh, say the patient has metabolic acidosis because of loss of the bicarbonate through the stool. How we give it? Either replace the stool mil per mil, we can approximate the amount of the stool mil per mil, or every one to six hours, or replace for each stool 10 mil per kg. While for the emesis loss, I mean the vomiting, the fluid used here is just normal saline. And the electrolyte given is just potassium chloride because the loss of potassium chloride through the vomiting, but the bicarbonate not lost through the uh, 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 stomach, you know. And the replacement here, even uh, the mil per mil every one to six hours or two mil per kg per emesis. So these amount of ongoing losses will be added, will be added to the net amount of a fluid of maintenance and deficit. Now we talked about the monitoring and adjusting therapy. Why? As I said, you put a plan for 24 hours. So at this time, now we are in, in 1.51 uh, p.m. Now, in this time, our patient is, is, is in severe dehydration and needs a fluid for 24 hours. But after six hours, may, uh, what happened? The patient may need another uh, uh, initial resuscitation phase because of another the patient develop hypovolemia or the patient may have improved. Now he is in severe dehydration, but after six hours, in mild dehydration. So this is what is called approximation. All these fluid therapy we put all calculation are approximating at the time of doing the plan, putting the plan. So it's need monitoring, uh, further monitoring, and excessive monitoring every time to see the clinical situation of the patient and how the patient will respond. So the monitoring will be toward what? Vital signs, pulse and blood pressure. The intake and input. We should put a balance between the fluid uh, input and the urine output because we give a fluid but there is no a flu, uh, there is no urine output you have to, to to change in our plan you have to do something and physical examination is very important the weight of the patient because may give more than the required fluid need to fluid overload so there will be signs of depletion or overload we give a fluid but the patient develop another attack of hypovolemia so we should monitor our patient not put the plan and leave him, and we should adjust our plan according to the response of the patient. And of course, according to the electrolytes, because the patient now is isonatremic dehydration, but then after six hours, he may develop hyponatremic. So what you will do? Or hypernatremic. This is the importance of the uh, uh, further or uh, 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 continuous monitoring. Now, we finish the severe dehydration and we go to the approaching the uh, moderate dehydration. In moderate dehydration, the principle is to give the ORS. 
ORS or what's called the oral rehydration solution. Here in moderate dehydration, we have to calculate the deficit. And the deficit is uh, uh, cut 50, uh, 50 to 100 mL per kg over the first four hours with 5 to 10 mL every five minutes. After finishing the first four hours, we give him the maintenance. I mean of the ORS, of course. 100 mL per kg per 24 hour until the loss is stopped. We suppose it is diarrhea. Then we have to replace the ongoing loss with ORS, 10 mL per stool, and 10 mL per, uh, per uh, kg for emitted. So, uh, uh, notice, in moderate dehydration, and we give oral, we should replace the ongoing loss. And we uh, should give him age-appropriate diet after rehydration. This is mean according to his age. If he is less than six months, more than six months, less than one year, more than one year, the age is uh, 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 the determining what is the diet is uh, allowed to give. In cases of failure of RS, you have a patient with moderate uh, dehydration and you start to give him RS, but there is no response. What you will do? Here you have to stop the ORS, and you have to give him a ball of dose of a 20 mL per kg of isotonic fluid for initial rehydration, then you will reassess the degree of dehydration. So well, after the assessment of degree of dehydration, if your patient is moderate, you can go on in ORS, but if he has severe dehydration, you have to change your plan, change your management to give him the uh, uh, IV fluid accordingly. The ORS can be, uh, can be then introduced if it is tolerated. Now we will go to the uh, approach to mild dehydration. Again, in mild dehydration, we have to, in mild dehydration, we have to replace the deficit. And the deficit here is my, uh, less than in, in moderate dehydration. So it is a 3, a 30 to 50 mL and should be given over the first 40, uh, 4 hours. Then we have to give the maintenance over the 24 hours until the diarrhea is lost, and again, stop, sorry, and again, the ongoing loss should be replaced, and age-appropriate diet after rehydration should be given. Now, this is the composition of the standard ORS, and inshallah, in, in next year, we will talk in, in clinical sessions uh, in details about the osmolarity of the ORS. We have the standard, the previous one, high osmolarity, and the reduced osmolarity, this is from the 2004. 2004. Uh, they start to reduce the osmolarity because this will de decrease the uh, uh, volume of the stool uh, by decreasing the glucose and decreasing the sodium and the chloride, while the potassium and the citrate. What is required from you is to know the uh, uh, contents of the RS in weight and in concentrations. So here is the weight weight of the uh, reduced uh, uh, ORS, and this is the uh, uh, osmolarity, and of course it is dissolved in one liter of uh, uh, water. This is of course the WHO, and this is produced by UNICEF and distributed worldwide, especially in, in the uh, de uh, developing countries. Now, why we give sodium and the glucose and the same fluid by the ORS? Because they found that in gastroenteritis, the intestinal mucosa retains its absorptive capacity. So there's what's called the co-transportation of sodium and the glucose with the fluid from the gut lumen to the circulation. So that's why we should give a glucose with a potassium. Uh, sorry, with sodium. Now we have what's called the rhizomal. Rhizomal, it is the abbreviation of the first two letters of the uh, re rehydration solution for malnutrition. This is recommended for such children. You know from the, uh, uh, the lecture of Dr. Zahra about the malnutrition, those patients with malnutrition, if they have dehydration, so we have a, a special formula of ORS for them, and this formula will contain less sodium because they are at risk of hypernatremia, and more potassium because they complain of hypokalemia, and the osmolarity is more than uh, the, uh, the regular one. Now we reach to the, uh, the ingredient of Rizamal, and this is also should be uh, none. And we, we reach now to the end of our lecture, which is the contraindication of oral rehydration therapy. This is very important, and you are uh, always at, uh, uh, not I say, not risk, at a situation to be asked about the contraindication of ORS by us 
and from the population, from the society. So if there is altered level of consciousness or respiratory distress for who cannot drink freely, or there is a suspect of acute surgical abdomen, like a bowel obstruction, practically, yes, you cannot give it, or an infant with severe dehydration, of course, we say the severe dehydration needs IV fluid rehydration. Children who are hemodynamically unstable, uh, how, uh, uh, we should not give the ORS, and those with severe hyponatremia, that means less than 120, or severe hypernatremia, more than 160, they are, should not give an ORS. So the children with mild to moderate hyponatremic or hypernatremic dehydration, again, can be monitored. Uh, sorry, managed by ORS, while the severe cannot. And even in the presence, you may face this question. He has repeated vomiting, so I can't give him ORS. No, you have to give him ORS slowly, and you will access in 90 to 90% of the patients. Then the failure of ORS due to persistent vomiting after trying it, and inability to keep up the loss, this will need the intravenous therapy. You, sh you, uh, you saw from the management of moderate, we give the RS, then we check if there is a response or not. So if there is failure, we go to the IV fluid. Then again, I should warn you about use of a clear liquid beverage that found in home are inappropriate of treatment of dehydration. Why? Because it will lead to hyponatremia. Now we reach to the end of our lecture. Thank you for your listening.